What is it, demand response? Especially in, elect in energy markets, in electricity or in gas. Well, if you are not following the policy workshop we are having here today in Florence, uh, you might say that uh, demand response is something trivial. I mean, in a market, uh, demand always responds to prices. And when prices go up, uh, demand goes down. But maybe it's not the case. Maybe there is something more. And we have here with us today, Frauke Thies from the Smart Energy Demand Coalition to discuss this important topic. So, Frauke, what is it, demand response, and why it is so important to discuss it in Europe now? Thanks. Um, you mentioned normally demand reacts to prices, to supply, uh, and adjusts accordingly. Well, that's something that in energy we've so far only seen partly, because only very few customers had the possibility to even react to price signals and to signals what's going on in the market. Most of our consumers, like you and I, uh, have flat electricity tariffs, maybe a day-night tariff, mm -hmm. but not more distinction. So we have no possibility even to react uh, to what's going on in the market. We can also not value or sell our flexibility in most markets today. Now, this doesn't need to be the case. Uh, and there are two different ways on how consumers can engage and valorize their flexibility. Um, and one is what we call implicit demand-side flexibility, which is um, the possibility for the consumer to see in real time the price signals that are happening on the market. So instead of having a flat tariff, the consumer will get a variable tariff and will be able to choose and say, oh, right now power is cheap. I choose to, for example, heat up my electric boiler um, because maybe next hour power is expensive and I will not charge up my boiler then, uh, to put it as, as one example. Very often in practice, this implicit demand side flexibility would happen with help of automation. Mm. Uh, so that the consumer doesn't need to adjust his Switch life in any way. Uh, exactly, exactly. Normally, in the best case, the consumer shouldn't even notice uh, that, that this is happening, or if so, then within the margins he defines and, and wants to tolerate. And of course, I'm now using the example of residential customers. You can imagine the same for commercial and industrial players as well. So that's implicit demand side flexibility. The incentive is. I save on my bill because I use electricity when it's cheapest. And by the way, I also don't need to pay my supplier for hedging that he does for me in order to offer a flat price. So I double win, basically, and the system wins. And I will come back to that uh, in a moment. A second type of demand side flexibility is what we call explicit demand response, where a consumer, usually working with an aggregator, which can be an independent aggregator can be a supplier, basically yeah, working with anyone offering an aggregation service, uh, says, I have so and so much flexibility, which I explicitly sell to the market. This is very often done towards balancing markets, towards capacity markets, where the consumer, via his aggregator very often, uh, says, this is how much capacity I can offer to be available on call when it is needed. So, for example, I offer balancing to the transmission system operator or to market facilitated by the transmission system operator. And when the TSO needs me, he says, OK, you offered so and so much availability. Right now, you need to activate. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, the incentive is to be actually paid for a flexibility that I'm offering. Uh, and both types of demand-side flexibility are possible in a the market. They can coexist. They even should coexist because they can offer different services. Um, for example, explicit demand response is better suited to offer fast services, like frequency control, for example, to offer into balancing markets, to support the local system if they can offer services to the DSO, to capacity mechanisms, but also, for example, on intraday markets. Implicit is very strong on the wholesale markets, implicit demand response, mm. to adjust to, to daily fluctuations. And then maybe to, to, to go to the second facet of, of your question, yeah, why, are we, why, why are we doing why all of this? And, and why now? Um, 
two reasons, I think, to, to name in particular. The first reason is because we need it more and more. Demand response has always been beneficial for the system because the system has always needed flexibility. But with increasing shares of renewables, with decreasing overcapacity that we are expecting to see in a liberalized market, the value of flexibility will become more and more important, uh, both within the market to deal with variability uh, and, for example, consume more when there is a lot of production, say, of wind and solar, mm. um, consume less when there is less production, but also to support the network and the grid um, to avoid massive investments in grid expansion. Of course, we will still need the grids as well, very important, but to make the best use of them, demand side flexibility will help bring down the cost very significantly. And we're talking very significant savings here. If we're looking, for example, um, at the UK market, uh, a study by the UK Committee on Climate Change has found that thanks to flexibility, the system costs could be reduced by some eight billion pounds annually in 2030. That's just the UK. Um, other countries, well, if you, if you add up the figures, you see very quickly it's rather big. where we're it's going. It's rather big. So the idea is to go beyond the traditional assumption that in electricity systems, uh, supply follow the load, but it's in a sense that the load and the demand can respond yes, and you're interact right. You're right. Uh, with, with supply because uh, yeah, part of the supply is no more so dispatchable as it was in the past. And for example, intermittent renewables you mentioned, and so now, also demand has to do and has the ability to do something. And there you're mentioning exactly the second reason why we're talking about it so much now. One is because we need it more okay. than, than ever. But the, the other one is that also we have the possibility to do it more than ever. Because to, to make demand response work at scale, you need the automation to work with it. You need to be able to aggregate the, the necessary data to activate the different consumers. Um, and we're talking about really potentially millions of individual units in the system that can be aggregated. And thanks to the technical developments in terms of well, IT uh, and uh, communications and automation. Okay, so we need demand response. We have the technological means to, to do it, but I suppose it's not the entire story because if someone follow from time to time uh, the debate in Brussels, you say that there is discussion on the enabling regulatory framework for demand response. What is in uh, your view on this? What are the key points for enabling demand response? Well, if you look at the market frameworks today, they have clearly been created and defined with the technologies in mind that were available at the time. And what we're seeing now is that many of the market frameworks are not fit for purpose anymore and clearly not to enable demand response. What we need is very simply access for demand side flexibility to participate in the market. And secondly, we also need the price signals um, to value demand side flexibility. Now, when we're looking at the very fundamentals of access, uh, when it comes to implicit demand side flexibility, as a consumer, no matter which size of a consumer, I need to have the right to receive real-time pricing signals from the market so I can adjust my consumption um, to, to these signals. Uh, and to, to facilitate that, I also need a smart meter that can record my real-time activities. And of course, I need the information on it in the first place, what are the prices at, at any moment in time. So that's, that's for implicit demand-side flexibility. When it comes to explicit, uh, it means I need to have access to the markets in the first place. So demand response should be considered as a product in the same way that um, energy from generation is, which today is not always the case. Some markets are simply closed for demand response. You can only participate if you're generation and that's it. In other markets you can participate, but you have to be at least 50 megawatts and you can't be an aggregated product, but you have to be one unit of 50 megawatts. Or you have to offer services for a certain duration, um, which is much longer than what the market actually needs, but you have to commit to it. So a lot of product barriers 
that exist and that have no technical justification anymore uh, that will have to be removed. And then another dimension is the one, the access for the different market players. Uh, and in particular, what I'm referring to here is that the consumer should have the choice to work with an aggregator, whether it is their own supplier or whether it is an independent aggregator or another market player who offers them the service to do demand response on their behalf. And today, in most European markets, that is impossible because if a consumer wants to work with an independent service provider, that service provider requires the agreement of the consumer supplier. Now, what interest does the, the supplier have to say, oh yes, please go and compete with me? Okay, you mentioned the access to the market uh, and then pricing, because a market uh, means that there is a price. What's your view on it? Absolutely. Access alone will not get us very far if there is no pricing really to be seen. And I think there we are seeing different challenges in the European market. One is that overall energy prices are fairly flat today, which is mainly a function of oversupply in European markets. So a big, big challenge there um, to, to see how we can get real price variability into Europe's markets to make the value of flexibility seen uh, to the consumer and to the demand response actors. Yeah, because otherwise um, there will not no reason to, to participate to for exactly. given consumption now for something later on. Exactly. So. And there is a second dimension to that, which is the, the taxes and charges and levies, uh, which today make up a very large component of a, especially residential consumers, but also other consumers, bill in the end. Mm. So even if your energy price varies, you still have this flat component, yes. which implicitly encourages you to simply So I would flat. say a lot of issues to debate for the legislator first, and then of course for the regulators at the European and the national level, yes. So definitely many issues uh, on, the, on the agenda. So thank you, Frauke, really thanks for thank the explanations you, and for being with us today. Thank you. Goodbye.